Hey, folks. Hey, everybody. Uh, apologize for the delay. We had some uh, technical issues with screen sharing and everything, but hopefully we've uh, sorted all that good stuff out. Uh, so we have an extremely... And it seems like our technical issues are persisting. The button I pressed 10 seconds ago came up now. Cool. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so as I was saying, uh, we have an extremely important topic and interesting topic here today with uh, John and Jason, uh, who will talk about uh, Java memory and how that uh, relates to Quarkus, right? That's right. That's what I hope anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's the plan. If we can share our screens. <laughs> Let's hope we can, because I'm sure people are eager, eager to hear this stuff. Uh, so I guess I'll let you folks um, like uh, move the show on, because uh, I know you have a whole sequence of how you want things to progress. Sure, if we uh, yeah we can make a start. So um, this this talk's going to be about um, memory usage in the JVM, um, and obviously memory is more than just heap. Uh, it's everything else that the JVM uh, uses in order to run your application, uh, and it was kind of one of the um, one of the driving factors behind why Corpus was started. Um, and actually, those I was thinking about this, Jason. Do you remember when, like a few years back, we were put into a room with uh, Andrew Din and Andrew Haley from the Open JDK team, and we were like, right, how do how do we get EAP to run well in Docker? Uh, and we spent the best part of a week looking at that. Uh, and we came away with some tweaks, but it still it still came down to the fact that EAP uses a lot of memory just to start up, um, and that was that was probably a year or two before um, the Quarkus prototype. I don't know if you remember that or not, but uh, um, yeah, uh, nice memories. <laughs> yeah, it was it was it was great because it's. Uh, uh, I mean, one of the things is that we were able to do in that um, is create um, some really cool like subsystem minimizations, you know, on EAP where we could take and uh, basically scale down a monolith to run efficiently um, in, in a Docker container. But um, the biggest challenge, of course, is that the, the, archi like the architecture of a monolith doesn't always, uh, you know, work so well uh, when you really want to, you know, get ultra achieve ultimate scalability um, in the cloud. And so, I mean, that, that was kind of a that was like one of the many points that had us thinking about, hey, maybe we should be thinking about, you know, what's what's next for Java that would really make it run well um, in this environment, and that, that's what ultimately led us to Quarkus. So I don't know if my uh, my screen is being shared right now. I can't tell. No, yes. there we go. Yeah, totally working it. great. <laughs> awesome. So yeah, so myself and Jason are going to go through. Um, what it means for running a JVM in a containerized envir environment. Um, we'll be demonstrating, well, I'll do some demonstrations in Docker. Um, we'll be looking at um, the problem that um, you have running a monolith in a container environment um, and what Quarkus does to kind of overcome some of those problems and make Java more lightweight and make um, applications run more efficiently uh, in a in a uh, containerized environment. So you can scale out your applications. So kind of like this was, this is, I'm sure a lot of people have seen these slide decks before. I'm not gonna spend too much time on them, um, but sort of, um, one of the um, problems behind running a monolith is hotspots, not just your heap. It's not just your working memory for your application. It contains uh, a whole load of other uh, data in memory. Um, it includes things like your, your, your heap, but if you also got meta space for your byte code, um, you've got uh, compiled code um, that the, the JVM is jitted. Um, you've got internal um, memory that the JVM uses to sort of like keep track of, of things. You've got memory around uh, uh, garbage collection, depending on what GC implementation you select. Uh, and it also retains uh, information around uh, symbol, uh, symbol tables that it needs in order to run your application uh, and any off-heap memory that your application may uh, may um, uh, reserve um, in order for it to for in order for it to run. So, <clears throat> one of the things that um, we as Java developers we kind of like think memory is cheap. Um, we've thought that for years, and we we quite happy just to allocate something on the heap and, and not worry about it. And then when we come to run it 
in a containerized environment, then our primary focus is the heap. Um, and uh, we, we do all sorts of tuning around heap sizes and generation sizes or, or whatever. Um, but in a, in a constrained environment, the heap isn't, your isn't the main uh, consumer of memory. It's, it's everything else that's around it. Um, so what we're going to do is, is, is kind of like run some demos that let, like visualizes this, that lets you see actually what's happening in, a, in an application when it's running in a container. Um, so I, with that, Jason, I'd, I don't know whether you want to continue now with sort of like how Docker, man, uh, how Docker measures memory and what it does with it. Right. Yeah. So I can go ahead and jump into that. Um, essentially the big thing, well, let me see if I can, ah, awesome. I just need to switch to, oh, nice. Get a never ending effect. Okay. Can you guys see my terminal? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Can. Awesome. Okay, cool. So what I want to show you guys is, um, Okay, when you measure memory, you'll notice there's like 17 different measurements that can <laughs> that can appear that will tell you like, uh, uh, well, this is what the memory is. And you're like, okay, which one's the, the one you want? The one that you ultimately want to achieve is called resident set size or RSS uh, on, on Linux. Now, I'm going to show you though, because you're most of the time you're working in containers and you're not necessarily working on a bare metal Linux system. So how would you do that? So, um, so I, I've just got like a simple getting getting started example. And I'm just going to go ahead and launch that. And essentially what this is going to do is just launch a single, uh, single Quarkus instance listening on, on 80. And from here, let's go ahead and there, I'll just move this over a bit. Okay. So if you, you could see the process running, you could see the Docker instance running here, Jason getting started. And this is the, uh, the container ID. Once we have the container ID, we can run a command uh, that's called Docker top which is not like the top tool that you, uh, you know, that you use normally on a Unix system. It's a little bit different. Um, it's actually the PS command and you just run it on the instance from the uh, container ID. And then I can type in a certain set of parameters to change which fields are displayed. So I can say um, dash O and I can say, I want the PID of the process. You have to do this one else we'll get an error. And then I want RSS. So this is the actual, the true physical memory. So this includes things like one of the things people sort of get confused about is there's this notion of sort of shared memory. Cause like memory is not something that's like an absolute measurement. Um, it is the, the operating system does some really great things to try to share resources. Right. Um, but when you're running in containers, you've got essentially an isolated application. So the sharing that you see in a container also actually counts against you. It actually counts against your process. So whenever it can, like you're, you're running on a container provider, uh, running in, in the cloud somewhere, some kube instance, and it's set to have a memory limit of say, you know, 500 megs, then it, anything that uses memory, um, even cache is gonna count against that 500 megs. So it's important that you actually look at the true resident usage. And that's what I'm doing with this command. Um, I'm gonna say comma args, which is gonna show me the actual, the, the actual command and then its parameters so that you can make sense out of it. And then when I run this, you can see um, the application is running and um, it's using 31 megs of memory, right? So it's actually incredibly tiny. Now this is one way to do it. And this is just using the, the Docker top command. There's another facility that's like MIM, but it doesn't quite show you the right thing. It's again, showing you a subset. Um, another trick you could do is you can actually go right in as a privileged process, get into the host and, and look at the process there. So like, for example, um, Let's see, just run this cool command. And this is in our, our yet to be published docs. We're gonna make this a little bit easy so you can just cut and paste this. Uh, but essentially this is this is now root on the host that is running all the Docker containers. So like when you run, um, when you run uh, Podman or Docker on your operating system, if it's not the same OS, so if it's not Linux, then it's going to create a virtual machine. And that's why like you can't just do like PS on your host system. So if you're on Windows, you can't just do PS and, and see the container processes. But with this trick, I can, I can run this very special container that gets me access into the host system. And then from there, I could just do a standard PS command. So it's very similar to what I just showed you before. I could say E for everything. And then I could say O, and then I say PID, RSS, args. And then um, because I'm gonna be listing everything, I need to grep for the actual name of the command, which was called application. And then as you can see, it shows up there as well. So we know that this app is using um, 31 megs of memory. And I, I, I could take it a bit further. I don't want to bore you guys with too many technical details, but I could do something like um, take a look at what the memory usage specifically is. So like 
um, if you actually, let me just go ahead and I grab this further for application. What I'm actually looking at is the, the way a process maps memory. And I can see like each segment of memory. So by gripping application, this is what's in our executable. I can actually see which sections of these come from which part of the application. So like this very first one that starts at this address here for four zero 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 zero. That one is actually our text segment and it's using 11 megabytes. So that means this is the actual running code. And then down here, I can see these are my heap segments for the initial heap that launches right away when the process starts. So you could use approaches like this to analyze the process and figure out, hey, where's the memory coming from? What is it actually using? So um, that's all I want to show you so far. So let me uh, exit my screen share real quick. It's, it's worth noting on the output, Jason, that you, there were two, well, multiple columns, but like the first column um, mm -hmm. was the reserve size, and then the second column was the RSS. So that's, that's the actual resident in memory, isn't it? So like the first column is generally a lot bigger because we reserve a lot more of the address space, um, but the amount of memory used is in, is in the second column uh, is a little bit smaller, and that's the key one, right? Exactly, yeah, because that's the thing that people get really confused about because <clears throat> like the virtual address space is really not a measurement of anything at all other than assigning addresses on the system. So like on a modern system, you've got 64 bits of <laughs> address space, so it's like unlimited set of numbers. So if you see a process and it's consuming like say, you know, 10 gigs or 10 terabytes or something ridiculous like that of a virtual memory, that doesn't mean anything at all. All it's saying is I've picked the numbers from the address zero all the way to whatever in case I might need it. And processes can do this. You could have a system that only has a very small amount of memory and it could allocate the terabytes of, uh, of or petabytes even of address space. Um, with no actual penalty at all. So never get, never look at the virtual number. It's not, it's, it was useful a long time ago when there was a limit on how many addresses could be allocated, but that's, that's no longer a practical limit these days. All you care about is the actual in use memory or the resonance set size. So the problem comes when that application tries to allocate to all of that memory that it's reserved. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah. If it started to, to, to map pages out of those, it, it'd be very troubling. Um, but the operating, I mean, the way virtual memory works, essentially the memory can come from anywhere, right? So like you can have an address and you could say this address, say address 10 or whatever, actually comes from a file. So it's not actually like, it's not actually creating memory or anything like that. It's literally just reading the file and the operating system puts the file in memory and then puts it at address 10 for you. So it's only like, what the operating system uses to actually accomplish that, they would, would then consume the resonance set size for that value. Awesome. So um, that there was, so that there, the, the, the application that you just shared there, um, that was a, a native application, right? That was a Quarkus application that had been compiled to a native. Yes. Uh, it, Exactly. So this this was a Quarkus native compiled application. So that's why it was so tiny. It was only like 30 megabytes right. for the whole thing. And then when you saw me looking at the memory segments, I kind of showed how like that first section is the text segment. So that's like the executable code. So your Java code that was originally in Java source got compiled into bytecode to make a jar file. And then the jar files got processed by Quarkus to be modified and optimized. And then Quarkus then passed them off to the GraalVM native compiler, which then gave us an executable, and that executable uses a like a compiler like GCC, um, like it's, that's how it works internally to, to produce this these instructions that get ran. So if I had done this on JVM, I would see a very different output. Which that I was going to be going to the next point because <laughs> sort of like that. the next bit I'm going to demonstrate something very similar, but it's on the JVM. So um, we have all the extra overhead that the um, that Hotspot brings. Uh, in sort of managing loading classes. So the numbers will look slightly different on this section. Yeah. You know, one thing I, for, I left off is I showed you guys if you're using Docker for containers locally. If you were using Minikube, so you're actually doing Kubernetes locally, the command you would want is Minikube um, SSH is the command. You type that command, it brings you right into the host process, just like that little container hack I did. And then from there, you could do the PS command to then see your process and then see how much memory it's using uh, specifically. Is awesome. that going to be in the docs? 
Uh, we should put that in the docs. <laughs> <laughs> we keep, like, at, there's like so many use. I mean, it's basically the same command, right? The same PS yeah. command that you could run. Um, in fact, like another way you could do it is you could modify your container image. So, you know, when you create your container image, you could have a base image that includes the PS command. And then you could do a Docker exec on that command if it's local or if it's like a running a Kube remote instance, you could actually, um, you know, attach to that local instance and then run commands there. And then once you do that, you could then do the PS that way as well. So if you're like talking about like, say, deploy OpenShift remotely or something like that, that would be right. Get, getting a shell on the remote instance would be the way that you would go about doing it. But, but you would need to put that into your container. Um, and uh, so there's like, there's like a set of packages you need to install to get the PS command. Because normally when you build a container, you, you're like, I throw all that stuff out. I just want my a native for running native applications. You're like, just give me the native application and the libc and, and I'm done. <laughs> so. Cool. Awesome. So yeah, if... Uh... George, if you would like to like share my screen now, if you can, please. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is um, I will do something very similar. Um, and I'm going to use the JVM instead of um, a native binary. Um, and what we want to do is on the slide I just uh, shared previously, um, we had um, details of not only the heap, but all the other memory address spaces that are used by the JVM. Um, and what I want to try and do now is um, visualize that to show you exactly what's happening. And also, hopefully, we'll see what, what happens as, as an application runs. So um, what I've got here is um, a Docker Compose file. It's a YAML file that will bring up a number of um, applications. We've got, well, it's, it's the same application, but uh, it's in a number of different frameworks. So we've got a Quarkus variant. We've got a Wildfly variant. Um, so we can do the comparison between, like, where we were uh, a few years ago to where we are now. Um, and we've got a, a Spring Boot variant. Now, the, um, the to-do application is a, a application that I've copied off, um, <clears throat> off uh, somebody else's repo. And it's a very simple application. Probably you've seen it before. Um, and it's using the Spring Boot APIs. So it will compile down to... Uh, uh, Quarkus application, but we can use the exact same application to create a Spring Boot one as well. Uh, John, can you make it a little bigger? I think it's pretty good, but just to make just to be on the safe side, yeah, that should be that should be. Is good. that better? Yeah, that looks awesome. Great. Thanks. Um, so <clears throat> what we're going to do is spring up some uh, containers uh, using Docker Compose. We we Quarkus was always aimed at microservices and and constrained environments. Um, so for this particular demonstration, uh, I'm going to lim limit the container to two CPUs and 512 meg of, uh, of RAM. I mean, this is a, a small container. Um, initially, we were kind of like targeting one gig of RAM because that was sort of like an AWS small size. Um, but we're seeing sort of customers using smaller um, containers than one gig. And um, what's really interesting is um, um, what we're seeing out in the field is customers will overcommit on containers running in an OpenShift cluster. So they will kind of, they will spin up enough containers to saturate the CPU like three times over um, because CPU can be scheduled in and out. You know, threads can be scheduled onto a CPU and scheduled off, but, but memory can't. The only way you really can schedule memory on and off a machine is to page. And obviously, you know, you want to try to avoid paging at all costs um, because your application won't scale, it won't perform. So what we tend to see is a lot of smaller applications. Um, we overcommit, but we but customers are, uh, that we see are using small amounts of memory. So here we've got a container that's got two CPUs and half a gig of RAM. Now the other thing that I need to do in order to see to show you what memory uh, the JVM is using is to enable this flag called the native memory tracking uh, flag. You pass it in on the command line, uh, and what that does is it tells the JVM to start keeping sort of like um, records of what memory is being used for what, how much is being used. Um, and we can start to have an insight into what's actually happening inside the process. So there's nothing more really interesting than that. So I'll just quickly come out of there and I'll bring these, um, these containers up. So <clears throat> as you can see here at the top, uh, I have... Uh, the terminal's a little, a little small. Yeah, that, that's good. Yeah, that's what I'm trying. Oops, too big. We've lost everything. <laughs> yeah, that should be great. 
Um, so what we've got here is we've got um, a number of applications that have come up. We've got a database. We've got our three variants. And then we've got this other uh, container that I've got running, which is an NMT tracker. So it's a little application that's is a, is a caucus application um, that will allow us to track the NMT, the native memory across all the different um, variants of the application we've got running. So <clears throat> what we can do, so each variant allows me to, um, to execute, or each Docker container, I can execute a command against each Docker container. So um, in order to view the native memory uh, of a Docker container, the command that you would use from the JVM is JCMD. Uh, then you pass the PID of the application or the process that you want to uh, extract the native uh, data from, the native memory data from. Uh, but JCMD can extract a lot of different information from a, a running um, a running application. The, inter the information that we're interested in is the native memory. So I'm passing in this uh, VM dot native memory native underscore memory uh, argument. So this is. Docker exec, so it's running this command, it's JCMD against a local running Caucus to do container that's already running. You know, one and thing just to, just to kind of clarify real quick is, um, so uh, this case, this is JV, this is JVM process. So when it says native memory, it kind of be misleading. That doesn't mean like a native process memory. That is like the, that is the amount of memory that the Java process itself is using including all aspects outside of the Java heap. Is that, is that the right exactly, way to say that, yeah. John? Yeah, okay. Yeah, it is. It's, it's the uh, memory space or address space that the JVM is using. So at the top here, you can see heap. Um, and then we've got you know the reserved and committed. So reserved is the amount of memory that the uh, JVM is reserved. And then committed is the memory that's actually in, you know, actually being used. So here at the top, we've got heap. And then you can sort of see um, information around classes, how much, how many, how much space um, class definitions have used. So the JVM will uh, load your application. It will read your classes through the class loader. It reads the bytes, and then it converts that into a, like an object graph that it then uses to run. So it knows how to, you know, how to make calls between methods and, and stuff like that. So it doesn't keep the bytecode. It creates this internal visualization, uh, internal representation, which is uh, the class memory space and then we've got loads of others so we've got thread and gc and compiler now this is pretty um verbose and um it'd be challenging to sort of like read through it and um, try and make any head nor tail of it so what what we have here is um a little tool that will help us to um visualize what that java process what it's doing how much memory it's using um so here this so we've got uh, the ability to choose whichever runtime we want to look at. So I can look at Caucus, or I can look at Wildfly. When I click on it, you'll see it change. So it changes from one process to the next, um, and it's so extracting that. This NMT is some like uh, general JVM tool? Yes, it is. So it's a command line argument that you pass to your uh, Java process. So when you start your Java application, you pass the command line flag to you can ha you you enable the native uh, memory tracking, and you've got certain levels of detail. So you can either have a summary level, which I'm using here, or you can go into much more detail. Um, and it's something you pass in when you start your application. Okay, cool. And then, as I, I mean, as I just demonstrated here, uh, in order to read it, you use the jcmd command, um, and then you can pull that, you can extract that information from your running process. So <clears throat> what we have here is um, three running processes. So we've got Caucus that's running. Um, and you can see that we've got um, 262 meg. I, I allocated um, 268 meg of, of heap space. So it's kind of like allocated all the heap space. And then we've got other information about classes that are being loaded. Um, so we're using 40 meg here. Um, there's other information around GC. So this is a space that. Um, the garbage collector is using this is the G1 collector. So you may notice that if you go from Java 8 to Java 11, the default uh, garbage collector changes to the G1 collector, and then your RSS size grows. I don't know if you've, you've noticed that or not, um, but that's because the G1 collector allocates, in this instance, nearly 91 meg of, um, of memory just to manage the, the heap. 
Um, and so this is the, the caucus example. So we've loaded 40, 40 megs of classes. And the Wildflare example, we've loaded 127 meg. Now that's just to boot it. That's not our application. We've not sent a request in yet. So we've not actually done anything with our application. That's just the frameworks starting up. And again, we can do for the same for Spring Boot. Um, <clears throat> we can look there and we've got 61 megs of, of classes loaded. So these applications are just simple to do applications. Um, you've probably seen this all before. It's one of our, it's one of the demo applications that we've got. Um, and they're all, they're all running. This is the Quarkus variant, but they're all attaching to the same back end. So if I refresh the spring one, if I refresh the Wildflow one, it's, it's all pulling the same data. So <clears throat> what we can see, <clears throat> what we can see here is um, we're pushing data into a database. All the other variants are pulling that same data, so we've got the same data that we're pulling back. Um, and um, what I can, what I'm planning on doing now, hopefully, if like the demo uh, <laughs> deities are, are kind to us, is to throw a little bit of load on this, and then we can start to see um, what happens inside the JVM when you start um, putting some load. <clears throat> so here, what I'm going to do is. Again, you won't be able to see this, will you? Is that any better? Yeah, that's way better. <clears throat> so this here is just calling a REST endpoint. Uh, it's calling our Quarkus REST endpoint, and it's just pulling back the JSON uh, right. <clears throat> representation of the data, right? Nothing too special. <clears throat> what I should do is um, I'm just going to put a little bit of load onto the application using work. So we're just going to just fire requests over and over again. And hopefully what we can see <coughs> is the, the caucus application. Excuse me. <coughs> starts to warm up. <coughs> Excuse me a second. <coughs> so, yeah, we're actually seeing that uh, <coughs> the the, the JVM's compilers are actually doing their job here, right? Like, so C2 compiler is <clears> compiling <throat> the Quarkus code in order to um, create more optimal stuff, right? And that is reflected in the, the <clears throat> memory that the compiler is taking up, right? Right, so that <clears throat> that memory the compiler was using was temporary as, it was, as the C2 compiler was actually compiling um, <clears throat> the interpreted code into, um, into uh, platform specific machine code. Um, and what you may have noticed is um, it's hidden here a little bit, but the code section has increased in size. So we've taken some of that interpreted uh, byte code, <coughs> compiled it down to a native code, and then that code section grows. Um, what you may have also noticed is the number of classes increased as well. So as we started our as we started our application, we've got um, some classes that we're um, <clears throat> that we're kind of like um, marshalling over the wires, JSON. Um, we're loading uh, different classes uh, into the class path. The number of classes has, has, has increased as well. Um, but the vast majority of this is, is heap. Um, what I can do is just quickly go to the Wildfly example, and hopefully um, the Wildfly example, uh, which is this one here, will demonstrate this a little bit clearer because um, the number of classes that Wildflow loads is quite a lot larger uh, when it starts bootstrapping the application and, and, and uh, loading the application. <clears throat> so again, um, this, is, this is running, uh, it's processing load, and we can see the, the impact on um, what memory is available um, to each application. And it's worth noting that um, and I haven't, re I haven't represented this very well. Um, this pie chart isn't the same total amount of memory. Yeah, right? it's, it's yeah, that, that's very. <laughs> it's all relative. Yeah, exactly. Because users might be confused about that. Yeah. Uh, that yeah, this is just showing percentages of the e each memory segment, but we're not talking about the whole size here at all, right? Right. Exactly. Yeah, what's so, useful about that is it lets you know like how your apps break down and you can kind of see some of the 
concepts that Corcus has. So like the thing that stands out, which I, maybe you were going to mention next, John, is the that class section is pretty big on other right. runtimes than Quarkus. On Quarkus, that's class sections sm uh, a lot smaller. And that, that's the, the, t the amount of memory that is used for every class file in your application is a lot. And that metaspace space is a significant increase your application. So Quarkus tries to reduce that for you and, and itself. But in general, like just good programming practice on any platform, you're, any runtime you're running against, if you can keep your dependencies and the amount of code mm -hmm. you have to load smaller, you're going to use a lot less memory. Right, and so that's that's where this the caucus build time, the augmentation time comes in, right? So, um, for example, with Hibernate, so this is a, a JPA application, so it's using Hibernate. Um, when you build, boot your Wildflow application, and this is like one of the problems of running application servers in a container, when you boot your application, um, the Wildflow has to load the configuration. So it has to sort of pass all the XML. So it's loading all the XML passes, class metadata into memory, just so that it can um, bootstrap your application. But once that's loaded, it's never used again. But like the catch is, it's never returned back to the system either. So it, it sits there, doesn't it? It doesn't, it's never recovered. Um, and with Quarkus at uh, build time, being able to um, generate the, um, the Hibernate metadata model um, that it then uses at runtime, it doesn't need to load all of those classes for passing uh, the configuration. Um, and, and that's one of the, that's one of the big, why the split was made between build time and runtime and build time optimizations, meaning that class definitions aren't pulled into runtime uh, and using all this class metadata. Uh, just to, um, just for, for like users to, to understand, uh, the JVM can unload classes from the meta space, right? But that that entails that you would have to drop the entire class loader, right? Right, um, and, and it it's very dependent on uh, JVM implementation as well. Like Hotspot, see mm -hmm. to to hold on to this <clears throat> to this class metadata. Um, there are times where it doesn't free up um, class metadata. You run out of heap space, or you can't allocate any more memory for your heap space, and then that's that's the point where Docker starts killing your application. You're starting right. to go over your uh, over the RSS size, and that's when um, your application's bouncing because Docker Docker's kind of saying when well, you're using too much memory, you're over the limit, um, so it'll restart your your container for you, um, and that's when you start these sort of like interruptions in servers. So that's why, like. The, the best way is the Quarkus way where everything that's not used at build time is just like a different step. It's an entirely different JVM. All this junk is just gone at runtime, right? Right. And and what you have there is what you need to run your application. And there's nothing more in order to bootstrap your application. Excellent. Um, so there you can see the difference between the classes that Quarkus is loading, which is 50, just under 51 meg, to Wildfly which is 136 meg, right? So that's a big difference. Same with the code section. So Wildfly, um, the JVMs had to compile 50 meg of code, of byte code, um, in order to get the performance um, from the Wildfly application. For Caucus, it's 27. So like making everything smaller, being really careful about what goes into your application really does pay kind of dividends because you end up with this much space for your heap, which is your working memory set for your application um, com well, compared to um, other runtimes. So um, we're running, a, well, starting to run a little bit short on uh, <laughs> on time here. There was going to be another thing I was going to demonstrate, but I think I'll skip that. And what I'll do is um, I'm going to um, run these three applications under a lot of load, so not just sort of like um, sort of like a, a, a small amount of load. I'm going to run them under a, a lot of load, um, and then um, if Jason, if you want to do your sort of like your object um, size quiz, so we can see what impact object sizes has on the heap, then we can kind of spin back to this, and then um, I can finish off the last part of kind of showing you the differences. Uh, Jason, you might be muted. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. I was gonna say real quick. Uh, we do have a question. I just want to make sure we get to an answer, which is, uh, mm -hmm. you know, do you? 
are you comparing with uh, with Spring Native as well as Spring uh, Spring Boot? So in this demonstration, no, we're, we're comparing, we're looking at the, uh, the JVM characteristics, the JVM runtime characteristics. Um, Spring, uh, like native, um, Spring native versus Corpus native, again, is another uh, interesting topic. Um, it's difficult to fit both of them because uh, within an hour, because you've got different tooling, but maybe maybe uh, that could be a, another topic for, for later on. You know, one thing I'll mention is um, if you go back to Quarkus Insights episode forty nine. Ah, you 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 did you say what? I, what oh, did I beat you to the punch, George? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go you ahead. want to summarize? No, 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 no. Go ahead, because that's like very, very important. Yeah. So it's the episode is called uh, "Why I Use Quarkus for Cloud Native Apps," and this is from a Quarkus user. Um, Pascal comes on and he talks to us, and in this he actually shows. Um, some of some real applications using um, Spring Native and using Quarkus and the differences. One observation he made in that session, which I thought was really interesting, is that the Spring Native overhead was the same or comparable to Quarkus on JVM. So Quarkus on JVM it gives you, so you got a whole, all the dynamic features of the JVM profiling and all these things that you get out of JVM versus native executable. And, and uh, it's using the same amount of memory as what Spring Native brings you, and uh, I, there's a lot we could talk about, like how why native compilation on Quarkus is so tiny. But I if you are thinking about this, uh, I encourage you to, <laughs> to take a look at your at your applications. Um, I mean, it's essentially the big thing is I, it's just like a two second point on on how this works with Quarkus. Quarkus is um, is not just taking your code and registering everything as reflection and then passing it off to um, to create a native executable, uh, because when you do that, you're, you're basically creating like a mini JVM. You're not really creating a, an, an optimized native executable for your application. So what Quarkus actually does is Quarkus takes the application's code and it trims your dependencies, and then it reduces the, the actual in-use memory set of, uh, which you could just see in the chart that John was just showing, like you could see the number of classes that's actually used by Quarkus is significantly lower. And that's because we're actually tailoring that jar that you put to the native compiler, we're actually tailoring it so it's a lot smaller and only represents what the, is actually needed by the application. And by doing that and a bunch of other things where we like we make wiring and all that kind of stuff be pre-computed at build time, by doing those build time optimizations, you end up with an actual real executable that represents the true uh, small state. To get to that, you need a build time environment. You can't just retrofit any runtime thing. Um, I see. Uh, I see someone's commenting about Tomcat. You can't, like if you just take any Java runtime thing and you throw it in the native executable, you're gonna see something that's very comparable to a JVM overhead. And and that's not what we do in Quarkus. Yeah, we go to a, well, we go through a lot of pain and to great lengths to actually ensure that this stuff, that only what is needed ends up at runtime. And uh, you'll see like, if you, if you follow Zulip chat, you'll see a bunch of times like, oh, we found that this is being used and it shouldn't be. And someone goes off and uh, figures out like what's going on and it takes a while. But it, the, the net result is that, yeah, what Jason said, we, we really use only what is absolutely necessary as opposed to just throwing a hundred flags at Graal VM and have it figure everything out at runtime and have it balloon your memory usage and your compilation speed, right? And that, that's one of the um, that's one of the key features of the extensions, isn't it? Like the whole point of the extensions is the extension knows how to analyze your application exactly. in order to optimize it for Graal VM. Um, so you can bring in any dependency you want, and then you can register everything for reflection. But you're into a Caucus application, and it will still build. But you're not going to get the same benefits or the the, the absolute minimum. Um, runtime overhead that you will if you use the extensions. Exactly. OK, so uh, you were going to be preparing some load, John, and uh, you, I, I should walk through our my little memory quiz. <laughs> right, so if you yeah, if you want to do that now, and then um, I'll, um, I'll prepare some load for this, because that's not something you really want to see. And then we can come back and just see what um, impact it has on some on an application that's had some traffic thrown at it. All right. Okay. One second. Let me get everything sort of going. And uh, click this button here. Okay. So we should have my screen. Yep. What I have here, 
is a uh, really, this is, okay. If you ever wanna know how much memory is my application using, um, but you wanna know like not, so John's showing you like the, the big picture, like overall in the JVM, what's going on, right? But what, okay, you're like, how, how do I impact that, right? So I mentioned one thing was um, reducing dependencies. If you reduce the number of dependencies that you have, uh, you're gonna reduce the amount of space that's used. If you reduce the number of classes of the system, you're gonna reduce the amount of space that's used. But what about like, if you're just trying to allocate a bunch, you know, memory, your working set, your heap set, and you wanna make it small, you know, how much memory is that using? So what I have here, the way you could do that is you could actually write your own little agent um, so I have a, just a little example here and it's really simple. You just write a pre-main method. Um, and then this pre-main method gets passed an instrumentation object and you could just stuff it in a constant. So I just stuffed it in this, uh, static field here called inst. And then, um, you can create a class that then uses that. So you could actually put this in your own application if you want to. And then from here, you can use a method called get object size and you could pass it any object and it will tell you what the actual cost of that object is, right? So, and, and this can actually lead to some surprising results. So if I hit this run button here, um, you can see down below it's printed 16 twice, right? So the cost of doing new object, the amount of memory that new object takes on the heap is exactly the same as this class I've written called byte size, which makes sense because it has no fields, right? So now if I was to add, um, say an integer, um, we'll just say something, then, um, I don't know. Do you want to take a guess, like uh, uh, around the <laughs> around the room? How what what will this increase the object size by? Uh, what do you guys think? Feel free to comment on chat if you have an idea about how 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 much you think how much you think this will increase the cost of by size. <laughs> I don't know. I'm scared to answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this might surprise you. So let's just run it and see what happens. Um, and the answer is it's the same amount. Look, 16 megs, or sorry, 16 bytes and 16 bytes. And you're like, wait a minute, how is it possible? I've got a field. I just added a field and it has the exact same cost as, uh, as not adding a field. So what, where, where is it doing that? Okay. So this is something that's, you may not be aware of, but when you use memory in a Java application, it may not be representing what you think it is. And so let's, let's go ahead and show you real quick a little, this is just a little picture I drew up. Okay, so there's something, this is, this is basically the notion of padding. So in this example where we got 16 bytes used and, I, and we created a new object, right? And we had no fields. The actual data that's being used is 12 bytes. Well, this, by the way, I should be specific. This is on x86 um, 64 CPU. Bit. You get, yeah, you're gonna have 64 bit. You're gonna have different outputs based off of what type of CPU architecture you have. But basically it's only using 12 bytes of memory. However, for CPUs to work efficiently, they, they, they need something called memory alignment. And memory alignment means you can only, it, you can, to optimally access data, it needs to be in a multiple of what is easy for the processor to work with. So um, on an Intel x86-64, the, uh, the ideal multiple is eight bytes. So because so our object- the, the cache line size, right? Yes. So like the you could think of it as like a CPU has got like a big data bus mm -hmm. that connects all the components between the processor and memory. And it needs to be able to grab a chunk from memory into the cache and then from the cache into the CPU. So the instructions mm -hmm. are going to work off of a set chunk of memory, right? Okay. So, cool. so in this case, we only, the object header itself takes up 12 bytes. And this is going to have stuff like your hash code, the lock word, uh, some metadata that describes what's the class associated with this object. And that uses 12 bytes, but we, we can only do multiples of, of, of eight, so therefore we have to waste an extra chunk of memory in order to do that. So in this case, we're, we have four bytes of extra memory. This is the next uh, segment. So this these two are what represents the, that 16 bytes I mentioned. So that means what happened is when I went over here and I added an integer, this actually filled in. So now I've actually got a perfect size. I've got two eight byte segments. They all add up to create 16 bytes. So what can you learn by this? You can actually get fields for free in Java, depending on what you have. So if you're ever thinking like, oh my gosh, if I add this field, it's going to balloon my, uh, you know, balloon my whole object. Uh, not necessarily. It might actually be completely free. Uh, so most of the time you get a free, uh, extra free four bytes and an integer is four bytes. Um, now I could show you that it, it could work the other way too, right? So if I add another integer here, I, you guys probably take a guess what's going to happen here. Um, well, I should probably have a different name so it doesn't conflict. <laughs> um, what we're going to end up with is um, now we're going to go, we're going to flow past it. So we're going to need another eight bytes of memory. So this is going to get full and then it's going to allocate this. And as you can see, the amount is 24. So this is what we're seeing right here where we have 
put in one integer and then the other integer has gone in. And then now we've got some extra space left over again. So now what happens if I completely, I completely fill it, right? So let's say we put in one more number. Then we should get, uh, ah, look at that. I did the same stupid thing. <laughs> okay, so we run this again. Now we're going to get um, 24 again. So now we've actually filled all this whole space, these three eight byte value groupings. Um, and now, okay, now you're like, okay, great. I've got three editors in my class. You know what? It's no big deal to add a Boolean. I'm just going to say uh, extra. That's what we'll call this one. Okay, so who wants to guess what this is going to do when I run this? Feel free to comment uh, on the chat. Here. <laughs> What's going to happen? Based off oh, what I told you. It's going to take another, it's going to go to the next one. Yes, exactly. So if we run this again, now we're using 32 uh, bytes of memory. So that Boolean cost us, so you can see this is what's funny about memory. An integer could be completely free, cost us zero bytes, and a Boolean can cost us eight bytes, even though it needs one byte. Um, so anyway, that's just what I want to show you guys. I wanted you to kind of, one, I wanted to surprise you and make you think, hey, I, memory might not be what I think it is. And, and also to show you how you can really easily go and measure your objects. So if you're doing like a big data structure, let's say you got an app that's got like really big collections and streams and all that kind of stuff, and you want to know how much memory is being used, um, this is how you can figure it out. And I didn't talk about like arrays and stuff like that. It can get interesting there as well, because like if you have like, for example, an array of bytes with a capital B, um, that's going to use uh, four bytes per element versus one byte if it's a uh, byte with a lowercase b. So there's it's, it's always important to think about what the actual cost of your system is. So just making something a collection to make generics work might cost you an extra three bytes per entry in your, in your data structure. Okay, so I can unshare my screen now. It's also, uh, <clears throat> like on that note, um, it's also interesting about choosing the data structure that you use. Like, so if you can use like an array, just a box standard array, that um, has really great locality in terms of cache lines. So if you know the CPU can prefetch, if you're going to iterate through that array and the CPU can prefetch it uh, ahead of time between instructions, that's going to be a lot faster than you know some other data structure like a, a map or a list or something because the you know the the, the um, objects are more spatially um, or more um, mapped out spatially within the heap. So like these effects come. When you're looking at sort of like performance in terms of memory, the, that, you know, that's one of the effect um, it can have. Um, not only cache lines and padding, but also locality. Um, like modern computers are pretty good at trying to second guess what's coming next and, pr and preloading uh, from memory so that you don't get any CPU stalls. Um, but you have to help them sometimes, right? <laughs> yeah. By the way, there's an awesome question that was asked, which is, uh, didn't the compiler remove the unused variable? And this is one of the things that's really cool about closed world optimization on native images. So a native image, you know that nothing's going to use those fields, so you could just delete them. And then this example would have produced <laughs> the exact same number. I would have never grown because I didn't assign a value. There's nothing that's actually accessing that value. But on the JVM, those fields were package protected. Um, they are not eligible for uh, necessarily eligible for elimination because, because classes could be dynamically loaded. Now a JIT could be smart and it might try and do some trickery to where it could remove it, but then you have to reload the class and then it has to recompute things. Um, so it's not gonna do that when it has to allocate a bunch of stuff on the heap. So generally speaking, if you have anything that is visible, so not private, it will most likely uh, not be eliminated in a JVM setup, but potentially eliminated in a native setup. Plus also, I mean, if you've got an application that's warmed, um, in, a, in a lot of cases you want to um, prevent any kind of the optimizations that the, the uh, JVM might do, because you start to see sort of latency spikes or throughput spikes, depending on what it is you're, you're measuring, and um, it doesn't give a very stable environment. Um, so yeah, that kind of, that moves on quite nicely to the last little bit. This is the last bit that I wanted to kind of show you guys. Um, <clears throat> so if you could share my screen, my screen again, George, that'd be great. Yes. There um, you go. So what I did, uh, <clears throat> whilst Jason was demonstrating there, I've run again, it's, we're looking at, um, 
just throwing some very simple work. I mean, this isn't very uh, complicated. We're not really stressing things in a major way, but we are putting load onto the applications to let the JVM do what it's going to do um, in a, with a very simple request. So again, we're using work. We're just returning the JSON objects over and over again, same JSON objects. So <clears throat> there will be some optimizations. It's the same data. It's the same call paths. You know, the, the CPU has managed to figure out by now actually what branches we're going to take and uh, what data needs to be there. So it's not massively realistic. Um, but what it does, what it will start to demonstrate is the differences it has on the JVM and also the difference it has on the CPU um, and um, the impact it has on how the CPU um, processes the, the, the code and access as memory. Um, so what I've done is for each application, for Caucus, Spring Boot, and Wildfly, um, I've just run a number of times. I actually warmed it up first. I warmed it up for two minutes, and then I ran a 20-second run uh, where everything should be compiled and everything should be optimized um, just to see what sort of uh, numbers we've, we're getting back from our applications. So uh, for the Caucus application, we're getting 11,000 requests per second. From the Spring Boot application, we're getting 7,000 uh, 560, and from the Wildfly application, we're getting uh, just over four and a half thousand. So you can see the difference between Caucus and Wildfly is over double, um, using the same container, using the same number of CPUs, using the same heap size, right? Um, and then if we go back to um, the native memory tracker, if we look at Caucus and we compare it, so this is uh, the application now that has been warmed up, and we compare it against uh, Wildfly, you can see that. Wildflow is using about half the memory in order to, to run your application. That's your that's the heap. That's your working set for your application. Uh, Caucus is, wow, well, we're coming around to two thirds. Um, what you'll also notice up here is this other segment, um, and that's the off heap uh, IO netty butter, dot buffers that we uh, that we have to, to manage IO. Um, so in addition to your heap, your objects on your heap, we also have this off heap area for for IO. Um, and then back to back to Spring Boot it, again. It's using more than um, more than Wildfly for the heap, um, but not as much as Caucus, and it's not offloading the I/O uh, into native memory. Um, so with Caucus, you you um, you know you send your response your, from your request or even passing in your request, um, and it doesn't touch your heap anymore. You, you know you. You know the uh, the application will will send your your data up your buffers um, and you're not taking any any space on the heap, uh, giving you more space to do uh, the application to do what it needs to do. Now the final final demo. And I hope we've got enough time here. Is um, what I want to do. So again, this command here using Docker top, which is what Jason demonstrated earlier, it gets. The, um, the process ID um, for the application running, um, the process ID of the host from the host. Um, <clears throat> oh, if I could spell, turn off cat lock. <clears throat> so that gives us the, pro the PID of the application <coughs> from the host perspective. And from running on the host, what I can do <clears throat> is I can use perf <clears throat> to gather some statistics around um, what the process is doing. <coughs> this process is idle at the moment. But it's not really doing a lot. <clears throat> One of the things we've got here is the stalled cycles on the back end. So <clears throat> from a processor's perspective, stalled cycles on the back end is you've got, um, you've got code that, that the processor wants to run, but that uh, core is blocked waiting on retrieving um, the required um, bytes from the memory. It can either be the different level caches or all the way back to main memory if we're, if we're really unlucky. Um, and stall backend shows us the percentage of cycles where the CPU is spinning, but it's not actually progressing uh, in any work for your application. So what I'll do very quickly is for uh, Caucus, I'll just start um, running some load at it. And I'll do um, a very quick uh, capture of the per statistics. Um, <clears throat> so we can see with Caucus, the back end was stalled um, for 17.75% of CPU cycles. Um, we can do the same. Do me. 
This is me rushing now. <laughs> we can Don't do worry, the same. I'm sure, I'm sure users will stick around for a couple more minutes because this is this is great. Oh, right, let me try this again. Right, so this is the Quarkus to do, uh, and it's idle, so we see a lot of stalled back ends. <clears throat> I've started Caucus up again. I catch up some stats. We see 11% of CPU cycles are stalled waiting for, for memory. Mm -hmm. Right, so we can kill that. Uh, we can start Spring Boot now. And I can do the same for Spring. Uh, sorry, I just wander up a little bit, start again. And I can do the same for Spring. So 11.8% of stalled CPU cycles on the back end wait for memory. Spring, it's now we're up to 15.5%. So we've got another 50% of CPU cycles that can't progress because um, we're waiting on um, either uh, code or um, objects being loaded from, from memory. And I can do the same for Wildflow as well. <clears throat> so Wildflow running, I can take the stats there, and then we're up to 20%. So Wildfly compared to Quarkus is spending twice as many CPU cycles spinning, waiting for the, for the data to be available from memory. And this all comes down to object size, cache alignment, and, and data locality. Nice. So uh, across the board, like the, 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 the indicative numbers are, the, are great for Quarkus, right? Right. I mean, apart from the, the really high level, okay, yeah, a throughput and uh, memory usage, like all this low level stuff that shows you the details just really, really says that, that the Quarkus is, the Quarkus <laughs> is doing better. It's like no fluke, right? Right. So throughput and response times, they're a consequence of focusing on mm -hmm. what the, what the applicant or what the framework's doing, right? So um, there's some really good um, mailing lists out there, like Mechanical Sympathy is a really good one. You get some really, um, really clever engineers on there that sort of will go into a lot of detail around all this. Um, and if you can optimize your code base um, such that it's sympathetic to what a CPU is actually doing, then improve throughput, reduce response times, it's all byproducts of that, mm -hmm. right? It's really helping the CPU to um to 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 process your the your application code as efficiently as possible awesome yeah so hopefully we've given you guys um some insight into some of the sort of tools and techniques that you can use yourself to get an idea about how your application is using uh, memory and then if you're looking at using corcus how that application using corcus can um reduce the amount of memory that you're using and increase uh, performance in a number of aspects related to that. Um, you know, in particular, being able to increase the density of the number of processes that you run, um, you know, in your infrastructure, whether that be in native or in, um, in JV and JVM mode as well. Um, and then if you guys uh, go, cause we have a lot of material here. So if you sit on this and you, and you're like, Hey, you know, something didn't quite click with me. I didn't quite understand what you guys were doing here. Um, definitely submit your question. And we can pick it up. We have, we always have, we're always looking for new topics that we're talking on on Quarkus Insights. And we sometimes try to do a and a session for anything that, you know, didn't make it from before. So if you have a question related to this, we'd love to like go into more detail about how we think about this. And of course, we always encourage you guys to do your own comparisons. Like, don't just trust, don't just trust things we say, just go ahead and try it out and see like, do you get, do you really get like a supersonic subatomic experience or is it just a bunch of marketing hype? We actually feel pretty serious about it. And hopefully you take, that's your takeaway as well. Right, and I mean, this, these examples are hyper-simplistic and the CPU will optimize them. Um, <clears throat> but um, again, like we always say, test it on an application, test it on a real life application that's doing some real work and see what it does. Um, this is indicative of the sorts of optimizations that we make, but um, the real test is if you get a, a real application um, and test it yourself. And if, and if it doesn't, then let us know because we're really interested in fixing it. Absolutely. Although I don't remember anyone coming to us and saying that, yeah, this is using more memory than my Spring Boot or my Wildfly or this, is, this has worse throughput. It's usually the opposite. 
but yeah, if there is an issue, then it, we're definitely want to fix it. All right. So I think, uh, yeah, we're a few minutes over the hour. So any last thoughts? You're going to, Jason, you're about to say something. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say that was pretty much it for me. It was the, uh, just, I just wanted to emphasize doing your own testing is always good. And, and then if you struggle with it, you can also ask for help on, like I said, you, we could submit questions to us or you could go on to Zulip and say, Hey, I'm trying to measure this. And I don't understand these numbers. I'm seeing what's, what's going on here and we'll, we'll help you out. Um, but generally I think you'll find that you'll, the numbers will be compelling in your own measurements. The one thing I would say that's important is, uh, make sure you're using the right tools and, um, approaches. So like when I was showing you resident set size, it's you can really get uh, you can get some misleading data out of other ways of measuring memory. Like the, there's a Docker top. Uh, it's not the Docker top command, but there's another like top like view for Docker, which does show only a subset of memory. So if you're looking at some of the fancy tools, um, you want to make sure that it's reflective of the the real resident size when you're you know what the actual cost is. What what the Linux kernel will how the Linux kernel accounts for memory. It will kill your process over everything, not just the tiny part that the tool uh, might be looking at. And uh, I mean, I was just going to follow up with um, if people do have questions, then reach out to reach out to us on Zulu. Um, we're always interested to hear um, what people are doing and, and what their experiences are, good or bad. Um, in this, I mean, as Jason says, it's important about picking the right tool. In this um, examples, um, I've picked the tools specifically for um, what I'm trying to show. It doesn't mean to say that they're always the right tool for the job, depending on what you're trying to do. So if you've got any questions around tooling, uh, anything like that, then then, then reach out and um, then we can we can have a chat. Awesome, awesome. So uh, thanks a lot, thanks a lot to both of you for being here, and thanks for everyone who is uh, here watching and who stuck around for like three or four minutes before we could actually get online. But I'm sure it was all worth it because uh, you guys showed some amazing stuff. So um, see you next week then. Brilliant. Bye Thank bye. you. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. Right. Thanks.